here at Achnacarry Estate today up near Loch Arkeg and what we're going to do is run through habitat impact assessment procedure and the methodology and maybe give some tips on how to use it and how to set it out if you want to try it out for yourself. What we're looking at today is how grazing may change the upland habitat. What can grazing do to the upland habitat? Well, it, it can change the vegetation on it. So what we're looking at today is how to monitor that change of the vegetation. Although the methodology is much the same for any of the habitats we're looking at here in the uplands, and there is a standardised methodology which we'll be explaining to you, we recognise distinctly different habitats uh, which we might want to survey as dry heath, and that's well-drained heathland, which is dominated by ling heather, Coluna vulgaris. We recognise where drainage is more impeded, impeded or if the uh, peatiness, peat depth of the soil is greater, so that it's a wetter, more uh, soggy environment. The dominance of Kaluna, ling heather is diminished and we see an increase in the number of uh, erica species, bell heathers, and we will consider that as wet heath. And at the extreme, when we're in really boggy, poorly drained uh, environments, we would actually be talking about what's, what's generally called blanket bog. The methodologies we're going to demonstrate to you are much the same for all of them. Although the key indicators we're going to be describing to you uh, do differ and those are clearly indicated in the best practice guidance uh, issued by SNH on their website. Best practice guidance is trying to ensure representative coverage uh, a measure of the impact of large herbivores, whether they're sheep, cattle, deer, with the minimum amount of observer effort. Essentially, it's a five-point scale. There's high, moderate, low, and the intervening ones as low to moderate, moderate to high. And that's all we're trying to do. We're trying to categorise herbivore impact, both grazing and trampling. And statistically, it's uh, suggested by the best practice uh, group that if you have a minimum of 30 2 meter by 2 meter quadrats per habitat type in your wider environment. So that would be 30 for dry heath, 30 for wet heath, 30 for bog if you have bog, 30 for other sorts of moorland scattered across the piece of ground that you are, the, this estate or property you are trying to evaluate but that only holds up as a robust statistical uh, shorthand, if you like, uh, as long as those are randomly distributed through the patches of that habitat. And the standardized way of doing that is to generate uh, random grid references, six figure grid references, and get a whole list of those for each of the habitats you wish to monitor on your property. If in fact you are, uh, obliged to follow best practice perhaps because you've signed up to a group deer management plan and that's one of the conditions or perhaps because of agri-environmental schemes for livestock farmers you may have had to uh, volunteer to monitor the effects of the herbivores on the vegetation and you have again agreed to do this to best practice then of course you must stick to that best practice and we're going to demonstrate that but we're also going to show you some additional things that you can monitor in the wider landscape around your formal monitoring plot so that you can actually put it into better context. Well, the first thing you need to, to do is download the recording sheet from the Best Practice Guides website. Uh, and it's a different recording sheet depending on what habitat you're on. So the recording sheet will then go through the set of questions in, in the sub-squares or the whole squares that you need to monitor. I have uh, made myself a kind of quadrat. You can't just go online and buy it. You really have to either make something or uh, invent it yourself. I made this one on the kitchen floor with some tent pegs and a bit of the fisherman's twine. To go with the quadrat, 
I need a tape measure and to measure vegetation height. I also use a GPS uh, so that I know whereabouts I am and to record the position of the quadrats. I use a compass to set out the line of where the quadrat is so I tend to use all mine uh, as north facing ones and then I need to number my quadrat and in order to do that I just made myself a set of numbers they're tied with it, a key ring, they're printed on paper and laminated and then cut up so I can turn them Get two sets so I can turn them and I stick them in the corner of my quadrat when I take a photo and I can turn them to whatever number I want. The, the ideal you. time to do any monitoring of this sort is actually uh, late winter, early spring so that you've got all the impacts which have occurred through the previous year previous autumn and winter, and uh, those are still apparent. In order to demonstrate the methodologies, we've chosen to use uh, quite a, a diverse area of bog, uh, identified by the fact that one of the dominant features is sphagnum moss, it also has cotton grass throughout it. There is ling heather, which is one of the major indicators for all the habitats we're going to be considering, but it is sparse, not because it's been grazed out, but simply because that is the nature of this type of habitat. There is also other heather. There is uh, ashy heath and there is cross-leafed heath. Both are bell heathers. Ericas, there is also quite an abundance of bog myrtle. Again, can be used as an indicator for browsing pressure. It's relatively rarely taken at light grazing pressures. And if you find bitten shoots, that means the grazing pressure is moderate to heavy. So there's immediately something you can think about. Bell heathers, Erica heathers, cross leaf heath, ashy heath, equally are not as palatable to grazing animals as ling heather, coluna heather. And so what you need to be doing when you're looking at your, your monitoring, you need to be assessing the, the balance of the pressure on bell heathers, erica heathers and coluna. If coluna is quite heavily browsed, but the bell heathers aren't being touched, then that's telling you something about the level of grazing pressure. If the bell heathers are themselves being quite heavily browsed, that's telling you it's quite a heavy grazing pressure, moderate to heavy or heavy, because it's unpalatable in the first place. And these are the sorts of general rules of thumb that you need to have in interpreting what you measure more formally. So this is your two meter by two meter string quadrat divided into 16 individual squares and we're going to use these individual squares to record some things and we're going to use the two meter by two meter to record other things. And the first thing I will then do on site is take a photo. So I've got a photo which is labelled which shows me where it is and I'll take a photo of the vegetation. I always set mine out in the same compass bearing. I always set out with one side going north and then I always number it the same way. And I think the best practice guides, it doesn't say you have to use the same compass bearing, but it does say you have to record that compass bearing. So if you are putting your quad out, you do have to monitor the same way around. The first square can't be square one one year and the opposite square one the year after because we're monitoring different things. So you do have to have some way of recording how where from your marker is, is a square one. And I do that by putting my quarter out and then always uh, working the north side of it. Looking at the blank of bog data sheet and uh, you're starting off with what, what date you're at, who the recorder is, what year it is, and uh, what site you're actually doing. You're then you're recording your plot number, zero one, and your digital photo number. You then also want your GPS and grid reference reading so that you're going to get nothing mixed up later on. So certainly it's a good idea to have the number in your photos so you're never going to get it mixed up and you must put your plot number uh, on your data sheet and it's one sheet per plot. 
the quarter outside we've got squares 1 to 16 and uh, the questions for different squares are actually different. So what we're looking at within the first square is quadrant 1 is what is the percentage of last year's heather shoots that are browsed. When we're talking about heather here, as uh, Rory said earlier, we're only talking about Coluna vulgaris, we are not talking about any of the ericas. And then you want to look at what percentage of last year's shoots are actually browsed within this. And you can do this in several ways. You can, uh, if you put your fingers on the heather, if a lot of it's browsed, you can actually feel that it's really sharp at the top where the teeth have actually nipped the top of the old heather. It's a bit like patting a, a, a hairbrush upside down. I can feel spikes touching my fingers or touching my palm, which says to me this has been grazed, I would probably find that that is somewhere less than 33% browsed. So what you want to record here, as Rory says, the percentage browsed in the categories you've got is less than 33% browsed, 33 to 66% browsed, or over 66% browse. So you're just looking at a percentage. You can do it by eye when you have more experience than using your hand, but if you're just starting, it's a good idea just to take a bit of heather in your hand and actually have a feel about and count the number of stems that are actually cut. So you can count the number of stems and then you can get a more accurate reading of what's actually, how many are actually cut and that will give you your answer, bare ground with your friends. Yes or no, you want to record that. And the third question is, is there a bog moss present? By that they mean a sphagnum, as we referred to earlier. And there's definitely sphagnum okay, in this quadrant. So yes or no, yeah, we've definitely got sphagnum in here. And the final one is the vegetation height. And you can use various methods methods to measure the vegetation height. I, I use this because it's quite a fixed rule and because it will stand up. You can use a pole with a flat disc on it as long as it's not heavy to give you an average. But I tend to do it by eye, stick it in at various places. Just doing detailed measurements on the heather browsing in 1, 4, 10, 13, 16 and the rest is basically looking for bare ground, presence of moss, uh, bare ground with hoof prints. The last couple of questions are, is there dung present? Is it hair dung, deer dung? I think if it's something else you might want to record it in the comments because there's actually a comment box. So you want to look about within the perimeter of the whole two meter by two meter quadrant and have a look to see if there's any dung and record that. If this was a slightly different habitat you would use a different data sheet which would ask you very slightly different questions but the actual way you set it out and what, what you do with that is exactly the same as this one. It's just the questions are very uh, slightly different. We've moved the quadrat to a second area very similar to the first but this would be a, a second of 30 such plots. You can see when you look at the vegetation it's much the same and again, if we were recording all the subplots, we'd be recording the same ones, 1, 4, 10, 13, 16, but we'd be doing other things for the, the quadrat as a whole. You can see there's much more bare ground and clear signs of the prints, and the ground has been scuffed up. So again, this emphasizes we're not just looking for grazing impacts, but we're also looking for other impacts by trampling and so on. Part of the essence of the formal monitoring methodology is that this is done on fixed plot, fixed quadrats, so that the next time you come to monitor this same habitat, it might be in a year's time, it might be in three years time, you come back and record exactly the same quadrats for that particular vegetation type. That means you need to locate them. Partially it can be done by using a GPS, but most people wish to mark the quadrat in some way, the position of the quadrat in some way, perhaps by putting a stake in one corner, knowing that from that corner, the quadrat has to point in a certain compass direction. Some people uh, bury metal 
discs or metal tent pegs into the ground which you can then find with a metal detector again the same principle it marks one corner and as long as you knew the compass bearing where you laid out your quadrat last time you can replicate that again large stakes are not a good idea because they identify uh, the quadrat in a way which changes it from the surrounding environment deer may rub their antlers up and down on them having a fixed stake there changes the way the animals use that bit of ground and so something very visible is probably not a good idea so what it says the deer eat the post they push it over they trample that area and so what you're measuring then it's not the same type of habitat as you would be without it but you could use your post offset five meters from the corner so that you know you can find your post you can then walk five meters on a compass bearing and that's where you put in the corner of your quadrat if you are committed to adherence to best practice because of perhaps uh, grant support an agricultural or agri-environmental grant scheme requires you to monitor the best practice or you've signed up to a group deer management plan which requires you to monitor to best practice then you must do so and you must stick to this fixed quadrat method but if you are not required to uh, adhere so strictly to best practice and you are monitoring perhaps primarily for your own interest to see how herbivore impacts on your environment may change then the alternative is to return to the same general area and set up a quadrat in the same general place so it's quite good practice to stand back after you've completed your detailed quadrat and look at the wider environment around it and try and assess visually whether the sorts of levels of impacts that you can see more generally are similar to and reflect what you've measured in more detail. Okay, so I have put this as hard grazed uh, or whatever the case is and go, does that, does that go with what I actually know or what I can see? Does this look like a hard grazed or a, a, a really a low grazing area? So use your common sense as well as writing the figures down in your and, sheet. And with experience you get to, to develop the skill to get that impression as you walk from one plot to another. If we walk to another plot now we can look around generally and get some feel for whether this has given us a good, uh, a good reading as it were. One of the things I'm often asked uh, by land managers when we're out teaching this methodology is that once they've got all their data, what do they do with it now? Well, one of the first things they can do with it is look at it themselves and see what the data seems to be telling them. So is the hill hard grazed, medium grazed or lightly grazed? And over years, is that changing? 